Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Ocean TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And on today's episode, we've got a really cool interview with uh, a composer. His name is Kevin McLeod. And he's, uh, well, we'll talk about in total detail later, but he's uh, one of the first composers that we're aware of that has put all of his music or a lot of his music out on the internet royalty-free to be used, and he's the subject of a new documentary by the filmmaker Ryan Camarda. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later where we talk to those two gentlemen about the project and about Kevin's music. Uh, in the meantime, we want to look at a couple current events, or rather news, straight up, uh, some cool Star Wars stuff I'll let Kevin talk about, and then uh, something that we found that was funny that I wanted to share. Uh, anyway, so John Williams, Star Wars 7. Kevin. Yeah, so... Um about a week and a half ish ago, something like that, um, John Williams was conducting a concert with um, an orchestra in Milwaukee. I'm gonna take a shot and say it's the Milwaukee Symphony. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, anyway, so he was conducting a concert and doing his little audience spiel stuff in between pieces, and he mentioned that um, he was going to be starting the actual com- composing work on Episode Seven in two weeks, which is now just a couple of days away, so that's pretty exciting. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then for any fans of Breaking Bad out there, and I'm definitely one of those, Oh yeah. Dave Porter was the composer that scored the entire show, all five seasons of it, um, or what is it, four and a half? No, it's five. It's five. Well, I, all the seasons. Um, so he's going to be in charge of the producing the music or creating the music for the Better Call Saul spinoff, and I've seen Dave Porter's been making a lot of announcements lately because I think one of the – they wrote a song, I believe, that aired on television, and you could check it out on YouTube as well, that kind of uh, was like a collaboration with a sort of a folk country singer that kind of – I think the was the jury – do you know the song I'm talking about, Kevin? Uh, yeah, I think I listened to it once. It Is kind of it like a little trailer of Better Call Saul or something like that, right? Now is that is that being basically implied that that's the, the like the main title for the new show, or it's uh, just sort of that's a good question. I'm not sure if it will be or not. I mean, certainly that song was written specifically for it. I mean, it talks about like I mean, it's it's directly about that character. Um, I don't know if, if that'll end up being the main title for the show or not. It's I mean, you know, they've they've the producers and and people involved have said that it's going to be a lighter show, much more of a comedy than Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad was obviously very, very dark, although it did have some funny moments. This will be more on the comedic side. Because um, I, I, I say that because it would be inconceivable to me that a show like Breaking Bad would have that kind of song as like an opening title. It just didn't, wouldn't maybe fit the tone. Uh, but this show could be a lot different, so who knows? Maybe that is going to be the case. I don't know. Well, I actually uh, I have a little small Breaking Bad story. Uh, I was scouring YouTube the other day, and I did not run across the tin- the song that we were just referring to, but I did see that someone, there was a fan that had compiled every death scene from the entire run of the show, and it was really well put together because they used the sort of periodic table graphics to represent... <laughs> the different characters, and they had different title cards, and it was 30 minutes long, and I was like, wow, this is that's kind of... a lot of, of people dying. <laughs> that's a, it's kind of amazing. And, of course, they were, it was, a, it was, you know, it was a, a violent but shallow experience because you weren't able to watch the show and, and it had learn anything about these characters, but it did bring back a lot of memories. But it reminded me that that was a very dark uh, and sometimes very bleak show, and Saul's uh, part of the show was, was funny, And I often thought if he had more time, the tone of that episode could be almost completely, uh, completely like more humorous and to actually enjoy his uh, his character a little more. So it sounds like this show is going to sort of um, deliver on that promise in a way that uh, I know the the Odenkirk, I believe Bob Odenkirk, the actor. I know he's more than capable of. So I I think it would be really cool and definitely something fun to tune into, and tonally a lot different than the Breaking Bad show. Yeah. So that'll be fun. So, and speaking of things that are fun, um, so I found, actually, Kevin, you linked this, so I saw I, it. Yeah, and I, I I think it just popped up on Facebook somewhere. I don't remember exactly who shared it that I found it from originally. It's, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure thing. 
Uh, it's a, a game called, is it Trent Reznor or a Household Appliance? And so you go to this website, it plays like a two or three second clip of audio for you, and you have to guess whether the sound you just heard came from a piece of music written by Trent Reznor or is the sound of a household appliance. And it's fun. It's, I mean, obviously it's poking fun at Trent Reznor a little bit. Um, and now with um, his newest film, Gone Girl, out in theaters for the past two weeks, uh, you know, we're, we're hearing some brand new Trent Reznor music and a lot of people talking about um, how important that score is to the film. And, of course, his coll- ongoing collaboration with David Fincher and all that kind of stuff. So it's not a surprise that there's a, a, a little bit more attention towards Trent Reznor um, recently. But it's fun. Uh, again, it's a guilty pleasure. Yeah, all right. He writes a lot of droney electronic stuff. I get it. Um, Bill, you and I were talking about this before the show. We both played the game. It's actually... I don't know that I'd go so far to say it's an easy game, but I think I did okay. When, when it was Trent Reznor's music, most of the time I was able to to get it, and when it was a household appliance, I was able to get that too. Well, I mean, I missed the first couple, and then after that, I, you know, I, I fell into my groove pretty well, but it was kind of, you know, shameful to hear something and think, that's a vacuum cleaner, and it says, no, that's music from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. <laughs> right. And I felt very shamed after that. But, I mean, actually, I mean, I I enjoyed his music in The Social Network. It's it's you know music and it's sound design and there was a very it was a very cool component to that film and part and part of what made the film successful and I just think it was it was really cool there was some cool, really nice ideas in there you know texturally and sonically um, and it kind of you know is more of a Hans Zimmer mold of approach to scoring uh, they even talked about it. there was a video that's also going around right now uh, through New York Times or at least some of the same composers posting this. The other, you know, the household appliance link, we're posting this one. And it actually came out when Girl with the Dragon Tattoo came out. And they talked a little bit about social network. But they showed his studios, and it's full of, like, you know, Moog synthesizers and, and things like that. And so there's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of hours spent doing these things. It's just a different – it's just kind of a different approach to scoring. And they even had basically said, we made probably about 17 tracks – and then just sent them all off. And I don't think they scored it. I think they just made the tracks. I don't think they looked at picture and matched actions to music, which is what scoring is. I think they just were basically creating mood pieces for Fincher, and they said, we sent off 17 for, I think, Social Network, and he said, and they took 15 of them. So they mm-hmm. they were, you know, it was an interview with... I it really say, becomes a big editing. job of, of music editing in that case, of just placing that, that right. music correctly. Right, and of course, it's uh, his collaborative partner, the British composer Atticus Ross, was, like, the two of them have been kind of working side by side on all these projects. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they said, so it was it was a nice, uh, you know, validation to get 15 out of 17, like, yes, these, these are good without any changes. And then it does. It becomes like when um, Nolan asks Hans Zimmer, to write interstellar music, which, which hey, we'll get to hear it next month. So there's that, yeah, yeah. and um, and not not seen any of the footage. He just gives them some sort of emotional he cues. Give him a script. Clear, it's a music for a film called Interstellar. It is not itself interstellar music. <laughs> right. Travels between stars. It's music that is very much grounded here on planet Earth. Right. Um, no, but we mentioned a couple months ago on the show that. Um, Hans Zimmer had said he'd been working on the score, maybe had finished the score or something. Um, Christopher Nolan didn't even... Um, yeah, no, he didn't let him see the movie, right? He, he It was completely... I'm trying yeah. to remember now. Yeah. And you had a couple of snarky comments. I'm sure I, I'm sure that, that sounds like me. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. So, Bill, what have you been listening to lately? Um, okay, so just uh, real quick. Um, so, the Lego movie... I had heard about it for a while, and I saw it. And first of all, the movie was really enjoyable and very funny and very uh, attention deficit disorder, but in an enjoyable way. It's definitely a, a film for children, but a lot of the humor was also aimed at an, an older crowd as well. Uh, and Mark Mothersbaugh scored it, and you know it was, it was a lot of fun, and it worked perfectly in the film. So that was cool. Grand Budapest Hotel by Wes Anderson with the score by Alexander Desplat was really, really enjoyable as well. Yeah. Um, and of course, I'm I, now. I, I'm I really dug that one. I mean, I think I I talked about mm-hmm. it on the show a couple months ago when I saw it in the theaters, 
And, yeah. And I sort of mentioned at the time, you know, he had been scoring so many movies, and you, you, you see lots of different movies with, with this blah scores in them, and none of them had really done a whole lot for me. But the Grand Budapest Hotel sort of converted me to the church, so to speak. Because it well, is, he, is yeah. so much fun and so radically different from, say, like Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows or something, mm -hmm. that clearly you've got to be really versatile to do something like that. I mean, that, that's hard. Totally. I At this point, I, I'm not just a believer, but I, I think he can just do anything. Any project that comes down, you know, comes on his plate, I think he can knock it out. Uh, and he, it's also, it's, yeah, like you said, it's very colorful, very fun score. Stay, if you, if you rent it, listen to the music all the way through the end credits, because it yeah. has this kind of like Russian, it's like a Russian balalaika orchestra. It's just, it's just, it's just nuts. It's so fun to listen to, and you can just imagine these like Russian dancers dancing to it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. Um, and then I'm on, I'm on the, as they call it, the Netflix schedule for The Walking Dead, so that means I'm knee-deep in season four right now, and again, I just want to give a shout-out to friend of the show, Bear McCray. I've been really enjoying the very subtle use of the score, love, still love the main title, and the show is just really cooking along. Um, I did catch kind of, we were talking about Guilty Pleasures earlier, uh, the second Sin City movie, uh, A Dame to Kill For, with, uh, as it's directed by Robert Rodriguez, who likes to use that kind of blue screen technique, or green screen, rather, technique, lots of CGI, uh, um, and also, like, Tarantino kind of likes to have a hand in the score, except Tarantino will put songs in his film to make the score, and Robert Rodriguez will sometimes use songs, but sort of come up with the music on his own, but this time, he had uh, Carl the uh, Theo, I believe is how you say his last name, who he had worked on previously to score a couple other films, and they collaborated on this one, and it was... It was appropriately, uh, I would say, noir-ish, so it worked very well like that. Um, Kevin, what about you? Uh, you know, the, the big new thing I've been listening to is um, just a couple weeks ago, Fox started airing uh, Gotham, which is their like one-hour crime drama based on characters from the Batman universe, uh, mm -hmm. where... You have, I mean, the very first scene of the very first episode are Bruce Wayne's parents getting shot. So you have like a 12-year-old Bruce Wayne with a young detective, Jim Gordon, as the main character of the show. Uh, music by Graham Revell. And the music, music is great. I really like the music. I like how it fits the feel of the show. The production value of the show is, is really, really solid. Um, it's... The, the design and everything really fits the, the character and the mood, I think. I was reading a review of the show the other day, and someone said, every scene looks like it had just stopped raining, and I think that's, that's a good <laughs> way of describing the kind of feel of the show, is everything is just kind of bogged down and kind of wet and just, blah, you know, which, which fits well. Um, I, really, I really want to like this show. I really, really want it to be a good show. I think if it were on like AMC or Showtime or HBO, it would be an amazing show. Mm. I think right now, it's it's it just got picked up for the whole first season. Um, I'm I'm I think four episodes in. I'm I'm usually watching them, you know, on DVR a day or two later. Um, so I'm caught up. Not entirely sure how long I'm going to stick around, um, but it has nothing to do with the music. It has. Entirely everything to do with the writing of the show, but that's, I've that's I've weird. heard I've heard some claims that it's corny, but like corny fun. But I haven't watched I haven't been able to watch any of it. I haven't it's, seen it. It's kind of fun. I, yeah, corny is probably not a bad way to put it. Um, but I think it's corny in the sense that it they don't have a lot of faith in their audience. Like there's a lot of dialogue that just has to really, really spell things out just in case oh. you miss something. And yeah. again, if it, but if it's it were, man. right, and I understand, and that's I think that's probably exactly part of the issue is they're saying, okay, it's Batman. Everyone knows how he came to be. Right. It, it isn't. It isn't necessarily a big grown-up TV drama, even though it's dark and violent. And it, it for network television, there were a couple moments with some pretty striking violence. Certainly not like Hannibal violence. That show is still in a category of its own as far as network television is concerned. Um, <laughs> but it, I, you kind of get the sense that they're really holding back on certain things in order to try to keep the audience as wide as possible. 
Whereas, again, if the show were on AMC or something like that, yeah, they would just make it the best show they could, and I think yeah. a lot of those things would go away. So, um, if you could compare, compare to other superhero series, how does it compare to the uh, Agents? That's a good question. Or We've, actually, you know, that reminds me. Um, or Green Arrow. Yeah, that reminds me. The new Flash series that is like in the same universe, if you will, as as Arrow, the Green Arrow show on on CW. Yeah. Started up. Both of those shows have music by Blake Neely. Um, the, and those are kind of not in the same vein as Smallville, because I guess when you think of recent superhero TV shows, those are all the ones that come to mind. You've got Gotham, you've got um, Arrow, this new Flash show, you've got Smallville, you've got mm -hmm. um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And then Constantine, I don't know if it started yet, but that's I on the way. That one started yet, yeah. I, yeah. Of all of those, I think the one I'm probably least familiar with is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, Oh, you don't watch it at all? I, I, I have, I've only caught, like, part of it, and I, I don't really know why. I mean, maybe it's because I'm more of a DC guy. I don't know if, if that's a good excuse or not. Um, no, it's not, because terrible. I'm a DC guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'll take DC any day over Marvel, but the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show is very good, yeah. and I think all the fans who bitched at it should be ashamed of themselves because... Well, like, to be fair, show, the first half of the first season was kind of wretched. Well, I don't know about Wretched. It was just a slow burn to set up everything, and it fooled everyone into thinking the show was going to be conventional all the way through because as soon as, like, three episodes in, everyone had dismissed it. They're like, well, this is not the show I wanted, and it's like an extension of how entitled everybody is. It's like, please shut up and just watch the damn show. They're the producers, <laughs> the actors, the writers. Let them do their job, and you watch it and shove the popcorn down your throat and shut up. And, you know, if it was terrible, then it would be off the air now. But the problem was is that it got really good really fast once the Captain America movie came out. I was going to say, which it was really good right around the time of the Winter Soldier tie-ins. Yeah. Yeah, what, that was also the issue was because they had, to, they had to hold the cards close to their chest yeah. that, you know, we can't let on how awesome the show will turn into because we had to wait on that movie to come out. So, yeah. Kevin, if you have a chance, watch, okay. watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but then there's, there is one that you need to stop and then go watch Captain America too. Right. And then come right. back into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Anyway. Um, so, so, Dave, going back to your question, how does Gotham compare to other, other superhero shows? Um, all the other ones in that group, you know, Smallville, Arrow, and The Flash, I think are in some ways geared towards a younger audience. So, by comparison, even though the Gotham may be a little bit clunky, I think it... it, it takes itself more seriously as like a, an actual grown-up TV show, primetime network kind of thing, compared to those other shows. I mean, I, Arrow is a good show. I, I like just the fact that Green Hour has a show is really cool. Um, but a good part of that show is about the guy who plays um, Oliver Queen walking around with his shirt off. I mean, that's a big part of that show. So Gotham isn't quite that transparent in its... <laughs> If you will. Now, so here's my follow-up question: If Gotham, with you know, with the music that Graham Graham Revel wrote and the look and the tone, which Batman movie series or which Batman movie does it most closely resemble? If if even in the ballpark, Tim um, Burton, Joel Schumacher. That's a good one. Nolan. Hmm. I would have it. it it's pretty highly stylized. I would probably put it somewhere, somewhere with in the direction of like the Tim Burton ones, not quite so out there in terms of the stylized. Probably, maybe even closer, believe it or not, to like the Batman the Animated Series, which is just it, very stylized in and of itself, but mm. not not so far out there like the Tim Burton Batman movies. It certainly is not not comic booky like the um, Joel Schumacher movies, but okay. it's also not quite... It's Again, it's a little bit more stylized. So not realistic like Nolan. Right, right. Like, the, for example, the, um, the police precinct that Jim Gordon and Harvey Bullock work in. Um, like, in a Christopher Nolan movie, you would expect it to be very realistic, like just a cold business building with fluorescent lights and stuff like that. Yeah. In Gotham... You almost feel like it's been. It, it looks to me like a retrofitted cathedral. It's. I mean, it has. 
<laughs> that much kind of style to it. So yeah, for me, I guess that maybe puts it closer to, um, <laughs> yeah. to Tim Burton. The it's, Tim Burton it's almost been a little a little over designed in some aspects. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. That's fair enough. So. I'm, I will eventually check it out, and I'm curious yeah. what the music in Flash is like. I am. Yeah. I caught the I caught the pilot of that. Um, that one was pretty good. I, again, I probably like, 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 towards a slightly younger audience. Um, when I say younger, I'm not referring to myself. I'm referring to to Gotham. But anyway, um, I think I think I'm perfectly allowed to watch that show. It was pretty good. I haven't seen the second episode yet, but the the pilot was pretty good. And okay. it, that's always one of the funny things I think about Flash, the comic book character, is his origin story is kind of absurd. And in the title page of every Flash comic, it says... Um, the fastest man alive? No, no, it doesn't say that. It says uh, uh, Barry Allen um, struck by lightning while being doused by chemicals. As if those two things happen at the same time a lot. And... <laughs> Or, or as if one on its own would not have been enough. That's right. But I, honestly, I'm not kidding. In the pilot, he was struck by lightning while being doused by chemicals. Like, they made it actually work. And that, I think, was, was hard to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of, of superhero music and Batman and all that kind of stuff, uh, up to now, um, there have been two volumes of Shirley Walker's music from Batman the Animated Series, La La Land Records has just announced the release of uh, the third volume, and in honor of the release of that third volume, I think they're putting the first two volumes on sale, um, so you can save a couple of bucks on each of those. Those are, are two um, collections I've been meaning to get because I've gone back to the the that the Kevin Conroy, Mark Hamill, Batman the Animated Series. Mm-hmm. Man, it's it's some. It's really good music. I don't care that it's a cartoon. I don't care that it was a TV show. It's that's it's just really good superhero music, despite yeah. those things. Live uh, orchestra. Um, yeah. It was yeah composed, orchestrated, and scored, and the animation is fantastic. The writing was great. The voice acting. It was really, it was like a golden era, in, yeah. all in and of its own existence. Right. I mean, yeah. Marvel. The Marvel cartoons never got near that. Um, well. I mean, and the, even a lot of the the more recent Avengers was really good for two years, but yeah. then they they killed it. But even even once you get to like the the couple of different runs of Justice League and things like that, they they it was never that same level of of music. I, I think. Yeah. No, it was great. The Batman animated series all the way through was was kind of was kind of amazing. Yeah. So really really good there. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Another, and then, another new release I wanted to mention. Usually we're talking about CDs. Maybe every once in a while we talk about a score. Um, this is the first new release I, w- I want to mention that is a book. Because um, believe it or not, sometimes, Bill, you and I actually read books. We can read. Um, every now and then. Every now and again. And, and not just comic books, because we read a lot of those too. This is a book. Uh, it ju- I think it just came out not too long ago. It's called um, John Williams Film Music. Uh, Star uh, Jaws, Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the Return of the Classical Hollywood Music Style by Emilio Odesino. Um So this was uh, written by a gentleman who did his master's thesis and his PhD in Italy, all on John Williams music. And so this book is is more or less a um, an English translation of his dissertation that has been made a little bit more audience friendly for the non-musically technical people out there. Um, I've been getting into it a little bit, but it's, as far as I know, there's never been a book out there about John's music like this. I mean, there are score examples, and it talks about all the different technical music stuff that there haven't, there ha- there haven't really been too many um, sources about John Williams' music out there with that kind of thing. Um, so, um, I, like I said, I just got it yesterday, just started reading it. I'm very excited to get into it, though. Um, Okay. So we'll go to Amazon and buy a copy because it looks like it's a pretty cool book. Yeah. Well, maybe we should follow up with that after you finish reading it, like on the next sure. episode. So um, in like nine months or something, when I finish reading a book. <laughs> right. The book will you'll give birth to a book in nine months. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and real quick, I want to give a shout out to our friend Tim Rodier and his Omni Music Publishing. They have come out right. with yet another full film score in orchestral study score format, which is fantastic, and it's Back to the Future by Alan Silvestri. So exciting. Awesome. 
awesome resource. It is uh, $75, and again, with the amount of rights that these books have to clear, <laughs> and the fact that this has never existed before in this format, uh, it's totally worth it, completely worth it. So this is the same Our company that put out... A score that's like 300-some pages. I mean, that that's a huge deal. Uh, and well, it's thirty. It's now thirty years old, or almost thirty years old. The movie. Um, oh, right, because next year yeah. is twenty fifteen when the hoverboards come out. <laughs> yeah, I'm still waiting on my flying car, by the way. Right, but um, but yeah. So it's uh, this is the same company that put out Edward Scissorhands and the Batman score and uh, the Matrix. Matrix. Yeah. And now Back to the Future, and there will be future releases as well with other films. So check that out, and you can go to omnimusicpublishing.com to uh, to purchase the score. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's check out our interview. Let's talk to Ryan. This is Ryan Camarda. He's the filmmaker of the documentary uh, Royalty Free Doc, or Royalty Free, The Music of Kevin McLeod. So this is our interview with Ryan Camarda and Kevin McLeod, the composer. So check this out and enjoy. All right, today on our episode, we're happy to welcome Ryan Camarda as the director and Kevin McLeod as the composer for the upcoming film, Royalty Free, The Music of Kevin McLeod. So guys, did I get the title right that time? Yep. Okay, excellent. So basically, in a nutshell, this documentary is going to ask the questions and pose the situation for Kevin, which is that he's one of the most listened to composers today because he's had, oh, actually it's in the millions of usages yep. of his music throughout the internet, throughout YouTube, uh, throughout actually like A-list movies. Um, let's see, I just kind of glanced at the sheet. It's basically everything, video games, movies, <laughs> uh, cat videos, Conan O'Brien's channel, um, wow. and just yeah, just the, the Coco Network, just to name a few. So we're happy to welcome both Ryan and Kevin on our show. So welcome. Yay. Thanks. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. I was like, what are you going to do with that? Yeah. No, I appreciate being here. I feel like I should leave. This is like too many Kevins. This is getting confusing. <laughs> I'll just call you Wilt today. Yeah, I almost, I almost opened the show, so <laughs> the problem. <laughs> Okay, so thanks for joining us. You guys are both coming from various parts of New York, so um, we're all sort of East Coast today, just in various strung across locations across the country. Um, now, how did... Uh, okay, so the project came along because, Ryan, you knew his music. Is that correct? Um, yep, I've been using Kevin's music for years because it was good and it was free. So perfect. <laughs> those are those are magic words right there. <laughs> and what were uh, some of the projects that you started with that you said, well, you know, I need some kind of uh, background music or some score. Was it a documentary or was it shorter videos or full-length features? Um, well, it started off in college, um, actually high school, I think. Um, then moved on to college, just you know, short films. Um, I did use it for uh, two feature films. I three feature films. There's actually, um, before I worked with Kevin, I worked for a kung fu company called 1T Entertainment. And I was doing some editing for them on their feature films. And the uh, guy said, I hate the music. Like, get rid of it. Completely, you know, screw over the other composer. Find me some new music. And I was like, <laughs> I know Kevin. <laughs> Right. And it fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. And then you just go back, yeah, at next time you need something, then you're, you know, it worked the first time, and I'll go back and see what else he's got. Uh, it looked like it, it was set up in kind of um, different categories, so it made it really easy for filmmakers to be able to choose certain cues or... Yeah, you can search by feel on the website, which makes everything way easier to find and really convenient. Well let's, well, let's actually shift over to Kevin, um, Kevin McLeod, that is our guest, and talk about uh, what, how did this all start for you, before you, the documentary, before any of that? Um, how many years have you basically had this situation through, uh, let's see, you've got the website is the main location that people would go to get it with, uh, in, in Compatech? No, wait, I want to say <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um... Gave me visions of office space, but 
<laughs> it's the fusion of incompetence and technology. Um, I mean, I started the site in 97, but um, I started doing music on it probably about eight years ago, nine years ago now, um, where I just had a bunch of music. And I'm like, well, I have a website. Why don't I just distribute my music on my website? <laughs> Yeah, it's not that. I mean, it doesn't. It's like, wow, that was a that was a master stroke. No, it was. Make it sounds so easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is before SoundCloud. It was before you know all of the distribution things came out, and um, very few people were doing that. So, why not? Was this, was this even before you'd have? I, I'm I'm trying to think of the the timeline here. Was this even before, say, like the iTunes Store? So just the fact that it was digitally available music that you didn't have to pirate from somewhere, that you could actually go out and just get it. Yeah, I th I, it might have been before that. Yeah, because that probably, was... Probably around... It, it, was, it was before, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I just put it out there, and then uh, one day some guy called me and said, hey, do you want to score my movie? And I'm like, sure. And then I went out to Amazon and bought some books on how to score movies. <laughs> As one would do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did a test one, and that's done. Well, so, I guess I guess that kind of leads to, to the big question for me is um, not only even though I mean, it would be easy and oversimplistic to say you're just giving away all this music for free, but have you been able to earn... A living from this, and and I guess part of that question is is the situation you were just describing, which is, does this you, the the or the business model you put together, I suppose, lead to like pay, paid opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're talking about like just getting new commissions, right now I've got a bunch of people who have gone through you know film school and have just used me the entire time. And now they're getting, out, they're getting jobs and they have budgets and like, hey, uh, I know your music. I know it works well with what I do. You know, you want to come in on this project? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> you know, you already like me. I don't need to sell sell my stuff on you. So um, that works out great. Um, there's a lot of nice people who donate. Uh, I still license. Um, pieces for things where you can't put a credit. Like if you're doing a radio ad, you're not going to put a credit for me in the radio ad. Right. So So is is that kind of your stipulation cuz I've seen it on your website it's, you know, if you give me credit, you can use it. But situations yeah. where that's not possible, then you have you make other arrangements, is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. And it's 20 to 30 bucks a piece. Sure. So it's even affordable for students all the way up to, you know, BBC or Discovery Channel or whoever else pulls it off. So you said uh, when you were asked to score a film, you uh, got a bunch of books and, and worked on it from that end. So when you first started, they were just sort of like fun pieces that had no necessarily um, specific intention. It was just, this is stuff I've done, and here it is. I believe it was, yeah. I'd have to go back and look. But that, <laughs> that's all about right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, did well. What's your background as a composer? Did you have like it was mostly just um, kind of um, electronic? Uh, you know, here's some ideas. Here's kind of like a jam session, or here's some cool things I wanted to try out. Or uh, no, I used to write back in the day for my friends in a rock band. Or or I'll I'll shut up and let you answer it now. But <laughs> um, I went to school for music education, so I got a good bunch of uh, formal education there. Whilst doing that, I was in a like a, a party cover band, and then I and then after I did that, I was doing uh, music for an improvisational comedian uh, group, and so I was just doing you know live improv music all the time, and that's probably where most of everything I know comes from. <laughs> Does that answer the question? I don't even know. I'm just rambling at this point. <laughs> no, no. That's what the show's all about, is just letting composers ramble. Oh, God. <laughs> that's, where we, that's where we... I hear all composers ramble. It's not pretty. <laughs> you know, I... No, that's cool. 
That's cool. One thing I was kind of curious about, I, I guess this isn't necessarily directly related to your the, the business model that has gotten you all of these licensing opportunities, which is, is certainly a big part of the documentary and, and all that kind of thing, but um, just the sheer amount of music you've written. I think on, on the... Um, I think it's on the, on the Kickstarter page, or yeah, I think, or on your website, or maybe both mentions, you know, how many different plays you've gotten on different um, different media. Like Bill was saying at the beginning of the interview, but just how many different pieces you have available, and it's a lot. Like you compose a lot of music, and I'm wondering if, if you can maybe touch on that a little bit. Um, well, when you get a deadline, then you write music until it's done. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you must have a lot of deadlines. <laughs> I do. I stack them up sometimes, three deep. Because normally you're, you send stuff out and you're waiting for somebody to get back to you with revisions, and then like, well, now I'm bored. I'm not just going to wait here, so I'll work on the next project. And Sure. Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, I, uh, I budget my time very, very poorly. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I will get excited about something, and I'll just, you know, 20 hours straight, and then I'm like, ah, well, now I forgot to eat, and I almost passed out. Okay. This... <laughs> and what, then, so, um, yeah. what is your basic, like, working method besides, um, like, pull an all-nighter? Uh, is it basically just, um, like, you got software you you prefer over other software or anything like that? or? Yeah, almost everything is put together in Logic... Uh, Logic Pro now. It does a real good job of uh, video, audio uh, assembly, and you know. So I I guess Pro Tools also does a good job of that. But uh, I've got a Mac. Logic is cheap. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and good. Oh, it's good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cha-ching, we can put the little Apple ad in the bottom corner now of our screen. And, yeah. Now, the Mac Pro was not cheap, but the software. <laughs> right, At least right. the framework software. The virtual instruments get real expensive, too. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to assume that early, that in the early stages, it's mostly I can make it quick, so I can make it, um, like, electronic and through the computer. Has, um, has that expanded so that... Uh, you know, now you're recording friends or instrumentalists, or has it always been a mixture of the two? It's very little live, uh, very little live recording. Um, there's, uh, there's just no good way to do it fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, every now and again you run up against it's like, well, I need a harmonica. It's like, well... There is no harmonica software that sounds anything reasonable. So not even close. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you, you, and, and, you know, Bill, we were talking to um, Julia a couple episodes ago, and who had, had had been scoring episodes of Bones on Fox, and she basically said the same thing with with um, you know, they're they're a big primetime show like that. That the turnaround is so fast. Mm -hmm. Just even the couple hours it would take to bring someone in and lay out some tracks, that's that's there's just time that's not there. It's interesting how that seems like it's more and more the reality for everybody, regardless of what the project is. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I might have another question for Kevin in just a moment, but I wanted to bring Ryan back into it. Um, if we could ask, so that uh, he's his interest was, of course, like we said, that he was a filmmaker who had used some of Kevin's music on some of his earlier projects and was a big fan of it and then wanted to create the documentary that we're talking about today because uh, he just wanted to make it known. He wanted to put a name to the music, I suppose. Um, and I just wanted to ask, it's a Kickstarter project, and so what state is it in at this point? Well, um, we're in a building phase. Uh, we're, as, we're sending fielders out to press in order to uh, get more attention. And the idea is we want to uh, spread the news about Kevin and who he is and what he's done. Okay. All right. So, so it's, still, it's still wonderfully in progress as, um, as yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so by the way, to those of you listening, we will certainly have a link to this um, on our website so you can check it out if you want to donate 
to Ryan and Kevin's um, documentary. We'll, we'll try to make it as easy as we can for you. Um, you know, one of the uh, on on your Kickstarter page, Ryan, one of the questions you mentioned, or one of the things you're going to be investigating, is do other composers like what he was doing? And, and for either of you to answer, you know, without giving away the whole documentary uh, <laughs> <laughs> ahead of time, I'm wondering if maybe both of you could go into that a little bit. You know, especially Kevin, what what sorts of reactions have you been getting from other people? Because certainly the internet is full of people who are kindly offering reactions to things. Well, I certainly de- haven't really gotten much hate mail uh, about it, but I really don't know what other people think. People ask me, it's like, how do I get my music out there? How can I get more jobs? And I'm like, all right, I've got a business model for you. Steal it. Here it is. Right. <laughs> Pretty transparent. You right. Can- you use all of the you say to those people like I'm not sure what you're talking about. This hasn't been a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, from from our end, we're um, looking into uh, like thing organizations like ASCAP. Um, recently, they yeah. put out a well a year ago they put out a memo that said like we have to do something about all this uh, Creative Commons by free music because they're worried that it's going to lose them jobs if people could get music for free. Um, so that's one of the things we're going to be investigating. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, because you know, both you know, ASCAP and BMI, I mean, you're talking about pretty sizable organizations with quite a bit of money. I mean, that, that I guess when, when I read the question that you'd posed on the Kickstarter page, my first thought was, yeah, h- how might other composers react to this business model because certainly I think you have a lot of people who their gut instinct is going to be well no I'm not going to give away all this stuff for free um, yeah, everybody but, has been like that right right, <laughs> right. I've, I've, I've honestly had meetings with 15 composers and they're like no no I'm not right. right and it's I mean that obviously your experience Kevin has has proven that there is some kind of validity in that business model. I mean, it has gotten new business, maybe not directly earning dollars from the things you're licensing, but eventually it seems it seems like it's come back around for you. But I think it's it's understandable that a lot of composers are going to look at that and and say, well, no, if you know, I work hard for this, I want to be compensated for it. I don't want to give it away for free. It's I mean, it's certainly an interesting paradigm that we kind of have to live with these days, and you're on one side of it, and so I guess that goes back to the question about reactions and, and you know, have you gotten any hate mail, but the, the point that Ryan brings up about looking into how ASCAP or maybe BMI or things like or organizations like that, I guess that hadn't occurred to me. I think that's a really good question. I have a question for you, Kevin. Are you currently in one of the organizations, the collection, uh, royalty collection agencies, or, and if not, would you join one? Uh, what, uh, number one, am I in any? No. No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like what they do. Um, I really don't like the legal pressure that they put on, like, stores and filmmakers, and uh, I think their tactics are awful. Um, I don't like them at all. Uh, I'm very happy to damage them in any way that I can. <laughs> um, and I actually didn't know that. Uh, they put out a, uh, a notice about the, the free music coming online, because that's, that's very exciting for me. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I have been called by them. They're have, they're, and they're trying to talk me into, oh, man, you can make all this money. I'm like, no. No, this is not how I want. I do not want to deal with the people who want to hear my music by forcing them to license stuff through this arcane system that I can't figure out. Most, <laughs> most big houses can figure. You know, if you've got a theater and you, you know, or 432 seats, and you know, we can. They know all the calculations for that. But you know, if you're just making a film that you're putting up on YouTube, you don't know how much money. Go- ah, it's horrible. It's a horrible, horrible business model, and I don't like them. Um, so, because I'm sure everyone who listens to this is a member of ASCAP or CSAC or BMI, but 
Um, no, Ke- Kevin, now, now be, be honest <laughs> with me here. Has there ever been a day where it's just like, you know, the end of the day, you got a glass of wine or something, and you're just thinking, you take out like the calculator on your phone, and you're just thinking, all right, if I had licensed the music for that Conan O'Brien thing, <laughs> how much would that have brought in? I, I, have you ever had that moment? <laughs> I I really haven't, and people ask me that quite a lot. Sure. Um, now I'm doing well, fine. They have licensed it if they had to pay for it. Yeah, they wouldn't have used it if they would have had to pay for it. Right, right. So, I mean, you're now multiplying zeros times, oh, it would have been a $15,000 use on television for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> So a second ago, you said you haven't received much hate mail, but let's talk about that little bit of hate mail that you did get. <laughs> and how did it begin? That's, that's the part I want to hear about. No, no, was it? <laughs> it's like ASCAP's calling you, which actually reminded me of an oatmeal cartoon that was, it could be, I saw it recently, but it could be years old, but it basically gave a... Uh, like, here's what purchasing music was like in the 80s, and then, you know, a decade-by-decade decade, uh, animated or, or drawn cartoon analogy for a representative of. And then it said, like, here's what it is now, and it showed all these, you know, agents, or it showed it bringing in Spotify and Pandora and sort of getting in the way of of just the person who just wants to get the music. And then I think the final cartoon drawn was, here's what maybe it could be that would make everything better, was basically the person paying a little bit of money to the artist, and then you have this sort of big, fat, like, agent guy crying over on the side, like, I want in, you know, I want to be a part of it. And they're basically saying, no, you're just a useless middleman at this point. Like like you said, an, an arcane, archaic model, antiquated, that has no real purpose. Anyway, I don't know if you know the oatmeal, but it was very... I, I do know the oatmeal. I didn't see that one. It's a, it's a pretty good one, and and like yeah, like Bill was saying, it's really, it I think I think yours is an example of exactly the type of business model it's talking about. Whereas you just have this direct connection to your consumer, they you know you, you may get some kind of compensation. It may not be a ton because you're not it, the the business model where you're going to sell you know 50 million albums just isn't there anymore. But it is that direct con- connection to your audience as opposed to all these filters of legalese and organizations and middlemen and all that kind of stuff. Do you think, I'm curious, obviously this is a business model that has worked very well for you and you've encouraged other composers to, to follow it as well. Is this something you see is a long, long-term sustainable thing? If every composer out there started doing this, do you, do you think it's it's something that would work for everybody? I think it will work for the people that it's going to work for. Uh, that, doesn't, <laughs> that is not an answer. Uh, okay. I'm glad we agree on that. <laughs> could, it, could it work? Yes, obviously. I think it could work. It could work widely. Uh, I don't see any reason why it couldn't or shouldn't. Okay. I think maybe in a in a strange way it might equalize everything to be almost exactly as it was when everything was paid for. So in other words, if everybody was given their music out, then it, it might be Ryan's experience where he grew he grew up going well, he he grew up he went through school in film school using the music from Kevin and then so he kind of like grew into filmmaking familiar with that work and then got out and wanted to use it more so there's a filmmaker that wanted to do it but if someone else went to a different film school and used a different composer's music that was free then they would grow into a sort of a relationship with that person so right. it might work in a case by case situation and if everyone's free then it's kinda like the same as everyone would have to be paid you just choose the one you want and then you go work with that person uh, it just makes it easier and cheaper, I suppose. But that's just my two cents. It's, well, yeah, it's uh, fascinating. Producing music has gotten way cheaper. You used to have to have a studio. You used to have all, you know, $50,000 mixing boards. And now you have a $200 piece of software. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need an underwriter to go and produce a thing in order to release it. Uh, so 
you know, films are still expensive because you still have people and set <laughs> involved and the, the equipment is still expensive. It's not as expensive as it used to be, but yeah, no, the price of everything is coming down and it's not going to go back up. <laughs> I want to ask you a very geeky question. Do you have a like sample library, like third party, that you'd have to purchase yeah. to use with Logic that you just can't do without? That once you bought it, you're like, this is the best like brass samples or the best string samples I've ever had, hands down. Um, the one that I use all the time is Damage by Heaviosity. It's percussion. Okay. It's really nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Brass, I use Cine Samples, Strings, I used East West. Um, man, the. Yeah, really, oh, there's a great new guitar out from Ample that I don't think many people know about. Like acoustic guitar. Uh, yeah, Ample Guitar. Have you heard of it? No, no, not yet. Well, just now. Yeah, check out their uh, check out the classical guitar. It is spectacular. It does. Um, yeah, it's just it's really pretty. Okay. And then uh, let's see. So, so we got the samples. Um, let's see. Oh, well, what's what's next for you? Can you talk about what's next for you, or are your are your projects all secretive? Uh, um, I. <laughs> I re I have no idea what I'm doing, and I don't think anyone realizes this. So I don't know what I'm doing next. Um, I just finished a film out of India, and I've got another one coming in in December, but that's a long way off, so there's going to be a lot more films between here and there. Uh, I, I, no, I just work, just work, work, work. Right, right, right. Yeah, have a good. Time. That is cool. Do you and then you are able to? You're. I mean, I'm not asking for the uh, you know the numbers here, but you basically are able to support yourself and write, or is this in addition to a job, or or can you can you talk about that a little bit? So uh, this, this this is my job. This is all I do. Awesome. Um, sadly, a lot of what I've been doing is like dealing with legal things and helping people on email and things of that sort and so like this last week I've gotten to write almost nothing and I'm getting a little anxious. Kind of getting the shakes a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just been all legal and contract stuff and social media things and it's like I just just give me I just want it like a piano for four hours, I'll be fine. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Well, why don't we go back to the, the documentary here a little bit with Ryan. I'm curious, um, you know, we talked about it a little bit. It's it's sort of in the finance stage right now. Is there a timeline, Ryan, you're looking for in, in terms of um, shooting and finishing this the whole thing? Um, well, we have to go over and interview, like, multiple subjects over the course of the year. So we're hoping it'll take about – we want to end, I believe, in – like have everything wrapped up in January next year. Okay. Um, just because we expect, like, because we have to interview the Fine Brothers and um, like Jack Vale and all them, so we have to try to line up the schedules just right. While also we we're interested in contacting uh, animators on YouTube. Um, so like it, like uh, CPG Gray, he uses Kevin's music. So when we talk. When we explain what, CC, what um, Creative Commons is and royalty free, we'd like maybe to have CPG Gray explain it so it's not boring talking heads. <laughs> um, sure. So with all this, it's going to take a bit of a time to put it all together, but we're going to do our best, and we want to make it sure it's polished, you know? Sure. So, Ryan, let me ask you. I'm assuming I know the answer to this question. Um, when the documentary is done, are you going to hire Kevin to score it? <laughs> um, we we were. Is the jury still we, out? We, just, you can just have cap licensed music. It'll be fine. That's right. <laughs> we, we could use Kevin's music. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, you know it's been a lot of fun chatting. Uh, anything else you would like to tell us about this project or collaboration before we let you go? 
Uh, well, we really need your help in order to fund it and in order to spread the word. I mean, if we at least spread the word about Kevin, even if we fail the Kickstarter, at least more people would know who he is instead of just like, oh, hey, it's that guy with the music. Yeah. Scheming Weasel. Which is like what we usually hear on YouTube comments. <laughs> you know, if you browse through, it says like, oh, Cypher. Oh, this. Oh, that. You know, five armies. But people just like, but wait, who's that music? Oh, oh, yeah, it's Kevin McLeod. Cool. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but cool. Yeah, it <laughs> seems like it, it really is the overall mission of this documentary is to really put uh, a name and a face to, to the music. Um, hopefully with our fives of listeners, we can uh, <laughs> do donations and, and, and some, some support and things like that. Yeah. Well, guys, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for taking the time out to talk with us about, you know, Kevin, what you're doing as a composer, and Ryan... This, this great documentary you're putting together about Kevin. Uh, we wish you the best of luck. Um, so well, like I said, uh, we'll put a, a link up to the Kickstarter thing up on our website, um, soundnotion.tv slash SAP. We'll have the link up there. And hopefully our listeners will go and, and contribute. And everybody, you next time you're surfing YouTube or anywhere else on the Internet, just keep an ear open for Kevin's music. Thanks for, thanks for, uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the interview. Yeah, yeah. thanks, guys. All right, and thanks again, Ryan and Kevin, for speaking with us about the upcoming documentary that you're working on. And, Kevin, that was a lot of fun. Right? I've never heard of a situation where the composer just gave out all of the music, and then they're able to build up their own career, basically, from that. Yeah. I think it, it seems like it's something you, you see a lot, not just in music, but in, you know, like graphic design and logos and... and all sorts of different media these days, and, and it brings, you know, I'm glad we got to, to chat with Ryan and Kevin because it's an interesting conversation. It seems like it is a, a change in the working business model that we're still squarely in the middle of, um, and and there, I think there are probably a lot of opinions on both sides, and mm -hmm. you could say what you want about that particular business model. I mean, a lot of people would make the argument that giving away... Um, your work for free devalues the work that other people are doing. I think there are, like I said, lots of opinions on both sides. But when it comes down to it, I mean, you look at the work that Kevin's doing, and like he said in our interview there, he's able to earn a living writing music, and that is a lot more than what a lot of people are able to say. Um, well, it always seems to me like no matter what decade you live in, when you're young and you have to get your stuff out there, then you have to do just that. And then once it's out there and people know what you do and they like it, you either have a fan base or you have networked uh, uh, professional relationships directors and collaborators and things like that. Yeah. Then you have a name and then you can get paid and people will come to you who don't have not had the experience to work with you and they'll you know, then you'll be compensated and sometimes quite nicely because you have a track record. But it's always the big question of how do you establish the track record. And so what I found fascinating is he's just doing it in a completely, well, as far as I know, he's the first one to do it like this to have that much success. And so um, it is. It's, it's, I think it's the beginning of a big conversation that may go on for quite a while. Yeah. Um, it may even, he may be the David that takes down some Goliaths along the way. I don't know. That would be the ASCAP and BMI Goliath. But we'll see. I don't know. We'll see how that shakes out. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, that will do it for this episode. To, uh, I was just going to say thanks again to uh, to Ryan and Kevin for taking yeah. out some time to talk to us. That is. So for anybody interested, it is Ryan Camarda and Kevin McLeod, and the name of the movie is Royalty Free, the Music of Kevin McLeod. So... That'll do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, uh, where you can subscribe to the show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. Thank you for listening.